when you think of investors, right, I'm sure you guys have had ideas in the past and thought of different things. Like, how do you perceive the investment situation and how do you even process that? And Carl, you're, you can also want to want in that situation now uh, with Maxine, you know, I, I what, what do you think about investors generally? The, the whole process what does that mean to you well i can say first that my preconceptions and my current understanding are different after you know like having experiences like meeting you at grc and you know starting to talk more to people and even looking into it myself which we can follow up with after but like working with a material like maxine it's everyone welcome to the it's a material world podcast so for today's episode it's going to be a little bit different we have two new faces joining us well one is kyle matthews who has been a guest on our podcast and and has been a key member of the it's material world team um and then we also have keong chen who is the co-director at otb ventures and so we're basically going to have a conversation where we kind of blend the worlds of business and you know venture capitalism as well as material science and nanotechnology and try to bring a ton of value to our material science-based audience we all just seeing kind of how things go here so it'll be a little bit of a change of pace but i'm excited to jump into this conversation and i just wanted to say welcome to the show Keon. oh thanks very much Panith. and nice to meet you guys virtually for sure so go ahead kyle no i was just gonna say just to start out thanks for having me on as well it's great to be on as a guest again and you know to have a nice conversation with you guys yeah let's uh, let's definitely uh, we can start since the guests have already met me somewhat why don't we start with a keyong introduction yeah thanks carl i have a little bit of a unusual um, background i think in terms of my career development i i've been self-employed effectively for over 15 years now and have been doing early stage investing for most of that time i you know i often get asked it's actually the worst question i People come up to me and ask me what I do. And Carl knows this from uh, from real life experience when we met at the GRC in Ventura Beach. And I was like, I, I really, I, I find it really hard to explain because what I do is, there's not much difference in my personal life and what I do, if that makes sense. So I suppose developed a skill set and a set of experience now where I, I just love looking at new things. And I'm just very, very fortunate to have grown up with a peer group of my friends in, in Australia, particularly in Perth, where I live, Western Australia and in Sydney, which I think a lot of people know where that where that city's at. But I, I've, I've grown up with a peer group of people who are effectively I'm part of this really dynamic, very, very diverse set of backgrounds of people who love investing in early stage things. And it's a very, and the reason why I wanted to, and I thank you guys for having me on the podcast. I think that it's one of my, one of my moral obligations really is to provide a bit of context for emerging scientists and researchers in material science. Cause I think material science is much, I was thinking about on the plane, I'm in Boston at the moment, I was thinking on the plane, the, the flight up, but. I think it's kind of like maybe something like when the internet started a little bit, a little bit like that, because I'm seeing the same kind of things, which, you know, I wasn't, I was quite young. I wasn't really ready for that phase, but I think where we're going now with decarbonization and where the world is going, making things better, faster, lighter, with less emissions, really being serious about the environmental issues that we're all facing and how important material science is, is that I think it's the right time to make investing a little bit more relevant and getting away from the fact that you know it's suits and boardrooms it certainly isn't not not in my world it may be in certain pockets of the world but not in my world and i just want i just want to take this opportunity to speak to everyone and everyone listening to the podcast and try to provide a little bit of my my point of view and hopefully people can take that away and go well maybe i've got this really crazy idea but i've been thinking about it for a long time i i think i just want to talk to someone and maybe and really it can make a huge difference and that's how the world works. And it's not about boardrooms and PowerPoints. I love that. So, so I'm just curious, since you had very, it's a, a background that's unique compared to a lot of our, our previous guests. So I'm just curious, how did you find the material science space? Like, you know, how did you get in touch with Kyle? And how did you enter this, oh, yeah. this area and get interested in nanotechnology and material science and engineering as a whole? 
Yeah. And so, so I don't, thanks, Mick. I don't have a research background. I, I'm a, I've got a corporate background. I'm a, you know, I, I'm a supposed a, a capital markets person, um, but I, I have a real interest in, in things. I think that it's maybe one of my unusual skill sets is I actually prefer to go out into the labs and the universities and wherever, wherever the people are to find, to talk to them, to, to, to be able to try to understand what they're, what they're trying to say, rather than like I keep saying, you know, I said a few times sitting in the boardroom, looking at PowerPoint and getting someone to explain, you know, their whole life to me in terms of their, what they're thinking in, in half an hour. I just, I just don't think that that's a, that's a great way to do it. But I, how I met Carl was, you know, was, I think, yeah, was, was really fortunate. I, we spun out a battery company out of the University of Adelaide in late last year. And that actually that company is now being acquired by, by another company, funnily enough, just last week by, by a list company. So that's going down a different path now. But when I met Carl, one of the professors at the University of Adelaide, I asked her, does she know anyone in the States? that I, she could refer me to. She's a battery person, right? And she said, yeah, I know this guy called Yuri. And I said, oh, who's Yuri? So I, I, I looked him up and said, oh, this, this, this Ukrainian guy in Philadelphia, it's kind of strange. I messaged Yuri and Yuri said, you know what? Yeah, Carl, you know what Yuri's like? He said, yeah, come to, come to LA to this GRC conference. And I went, I had no idea what he's talking about. I had zero <laughs> clue, but I just thought, I just something instinctive in me went, I think I should go. I, I think... And I talked talk to my wife. I said, I think I should go to this thing. And they're going, what the heck are you doing? Like, where, where, where so why? I said, well, I looked at the format and I didn't really know. And I think, Carl, you've spoken about GRC formats in a previous podcast. But they're really, really, it's like sitting in a, in a camp for, for, for a week where you basically just hang around these brilliant people day after day after day. But I had no idea. So I looked at the agenda. It looked like a dormitory style thing. And, and I went. And I remember very clearly, it's actually on my LinkedIn somewhere, or I must have posted it, a, that first night, Carl, I don't know where you were, but I remember there's a photo of Yuri, Stan, Winningham, and Shirley, and myself. That first night, I mean, that's just, what, what's that? You know, so I think if there's another thing in this is that, not just for myself, but, and, and I think one of the things that should resonate is that if you've got a chance to do something, it, it's really, trust me, going on that plane, going to LA, not knowing anyone, I don't know what's going to happen. It was kind of, kind of scary, a little bit awkward, right? But if I hadn't done that, then I certainly wouldn't have met Carl, I certainly wouldn't have met yourself, I certainly wouldn't be having this discussion. So it's really important to say, right, I've, you know, if you have the opportunity and you've got the time, you've got the health to do it, I think it's a good idea to take the opportunity because you just never know. And that's how we ended up in this situation. I think going to material science, it just, it was in my mind that I knew broadly, thematically, it was really important, but I never had any idea that it was so interesting and there were so many investment opportunities, let alone really brilliant people to talk to. So you said to yourself that you're not really from a research background and you don't know too much about like the fundamentals of like maybe some of the things that they're talking about in more detail. I'm just curious, like from your perspective, I'm sure you hear all these great ideas all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How do you kind of differentiate which ones you think are the best and which ones are maybe ones that you would pass on when you don't like when you're not a cutting edge research scientist? Because I'm sure you see the whole range of ideas. Yeah, David, that's a really good question. And one I get asked a lot. I think that's another way to look at it. You know, even even leading edge scientists find other people's researchers ideas. You can ask 10 researchers, and Carl, you know this, you ask 10 researchers one uh, on the subject man, you'll get, you probably get 10 opinions. You know, it, it's something like that. I've watched very carefully, David, like when, you know, in the conferences, even though Carl, you know, at the GRC and things like that, I may appear like I'm half asleep. Sometimes I am, but I'm watching, I'm watching people's body language and I'm watching how people are receptive. You know, people stop playing with their laptops and phones. That's a generally a good eye, good signal that there's something really important going here. And then you, you also find when you go when you when you go out and have drinks after the presentations and you talk about oh yeah what do you think of the presentations, it actually comes up pretty consistent. The good ones they talk about, and I would make a deliberate. I mean this is in terms of the conference, but I I would make a make a note to say look I've just got to say hello to this person and just say look this is this is kind of what I do. And certainly David I tell them straight up I got no idea I have no science background, but would you be able to explain to me what you were talking about? And I think the good researchers can. I think that's part of their role. You know, essentially they're 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 teachers, right? They're teaching, so they've got to be able to relate. You know, and I think if something is really good and and really meaningful, they can explain it, and I'll understand it, and then we can go to the next step. And I think now, David, like I've I think I've created a little bit of a network of people who don't mind Carl included. You know, they don't mind looking at this stuff for me. All different types. Not I can have a battery project, but I can have non-battery people look at it too. You know, because I appreciate the different perspectives because sometimes, as Carl knows, battery people are 
really can be very biased on their on a particular type of technology. You know, it could be solid state. That's the best things in sliced bread. Yeah, I think so. But how about people who don't know too much about it and they can read the, the, the journals and look at the research and have a thing about a lot of it, David's also people is a person thing. It was really a person thing. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of personalities and, and I think Carl, it wouldn't be too far to say there's, there's a lot of egos in the room sometimes. And, and I think you just got to be able to relate to someone as, as, and you really like them. You know, you like this person and they've got some really cool research. Then we can move on the next stage. But no matter how good the research is, if I don't get the vibe and I, I feel like it's, it's a bit strange, I'll, I'll probably just park it for a while and then, you know, let it, let it see what happens from there. Yeah, from that, I can definitely say, like, from my initial experience, like, when I met Kyung at GRC, which I spoke about the last time I was here, it's, you're going to basically be faced with superstar research the whole time, because you're at GRC. That's the point. But you have to, to differentiate it at the next level. In the end, it's people, you know, people are presenting this research, and the research was done by researchers. So, you know, I think even though, like, Kyung doesn't have this science background, like, uh, he still has the people background. And that's kind of like what allows you to get that initial step in. And then, yeah, at some point you're going to have to start mixing, you know, sifting through the the mud, you know, so to say, to pick out what makes sense, maybe start getting some consultations from people who have like a deeper technical background. But that initial, I would say that initial part, like I remember distinctively, like there was like a few talks where, you know, like I, I sat through them and I was like, those were amazing talks. Like they were all amazing, but some in particular, like I remember like, had me sitting down like I was you know I was writing down everything and probably you know Keong Sol you know I wasn't the only one that was writing down every word and he could he can see that and know like they must be talking about something important so you know it definitely goes hand in hand so Keong I'm just curious then I know you mentioned or Kyle mentioned like you're you know people right and so technology aside for just a moment what kind of key characteristics are you looking for in the in the the leaders that you end up you know, deciding to partner with or, you know, deciding to invest in both monetarily and just investing your time into these people? Are there kind of common characteristics that you see either from like the leadership perspective or just like you said, the ability to communicate, et cetera? Oh, look, I, I yeah, that's a great question, Nick. I, I don't think I'm, I, I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't look at it from a point of view, like, you know, it needs to be, like they need to be excellent communicators. I mean, they could not communicate very, they may not communicate very well. And Oftentimes, you know, researchers are generally quite introverted. And that's saying not you, Carl. You're a different guy, <laughs> but, as we know. But, uh, you know, generally, most of them, a lot of them are really introverted. So how do you get them in a situation where they're, they're comfortable to talk to an investor? And actually, I think people forget. I mean, they know I invest in stuff, but uh, they forget. Like, because we're just talking. I think what I'm trying to find in, in these people is I want to, I want to see the passion. I, I want to, I want to see like, this is not just like research to get their PhD or, you know, for publish something. I, I, I can feel when they're, they're just like, I've just been thinking about this. I've been researching this for a long time. And I really want to get this out into the real world. Like this is important. And I think once I, once I get that sense, then we can have the discussion and and then it becomes more like a vibe thing, I, you know, it's a chemistry thing and it's a people thing. I, I was actually, here's, here's a good example. So I was at, where was I yesterday? I was in Knoxville. I was in Knoxville last night and I went there because I got there because someone I knew really senior guy at Uni of Sydney, a professor, he, he's, he had this great additive manufacturing project. And um, I don't know if you guys have come across additive manufacturing on any of the episodes, but that's a thing, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work it out myself, but that's a thing for sure. Just by the nature of it, you know, it's, there's something really cool there. I think it's about scaling and how to do that, but that's, that's something I'm thinking about. And then he said, well, are you, if you go to the States, Keon, why don't you go to Knoxville and go to Oak Ridge, the national lab? And I, went, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have zero clue. But of course, as you can tell, I just said, yes, I, I turned up. And then I, I met the people there and they were like, well, you know, we've got the, we've got the other manufacturing stuff, but we've actually got lots of different projects and uh, university is, is quite large. University of Tennessee, they've got quite a material science thing going on there. I met a few people and after we you know we had i had dinner with a couple of um a couple of their senior guys last night i got a text i got the phone number for one of the the startups you know he's, he's just completing his phd nice guy really nice guy i really like him and uh, he said oh yeah i said what are you guys doing tonight you know and they said oh we're going out cool i i finished dinner and we went, went out and we caught up this is a big big bar or pub or something and basically all of, a lot of the startup guys from the university were there so they're very spun out their companies they've raised quite a bit of you know, doe money and dod money and they've got different projects and batteries and general material science 
So now in your average age, what, 30, 30, 35 in that zone? And they were all there. I didn't know that, but I knew that it was important for me to have these discussions. And, you know, they were wondering, I think a few of them came up to me around midnight and they went like, Keong, like at that point, I, you know, I was wearing a hat and just, you know, just walking around talking to people. And the discussions we had last night was way better than any of the conversations we had in the boardroom with, you know, with like the, the kind of the formality of it. They were very, very open with your issues in terms of the technical issues, the corporate issues, dealing with investors, you know, how, how much it weighed on them, you know, and it was just, it was just such a great environment to talk about that. And, and I got a real understanding of the people. And in the end, we, we come out, you know, in the morning and, and I've got some texts and stuff from, it's not the emails anymore now. It's, it's, re, it's come, it's the texts, right? You know, emails are okay to do the, form, the formal stuff and the summarize project stuff maybe, but they're terrible for relationship, aren't they? They're, they're just awful. When I've got that now, I think we trust each other now. We, I might not invest in their stuff or, you know, they may, I think that's another, it's expanding the network again. And, you know, it, it's, it, and they, they were saying to me, Keon, your whole relaxed approach to it all is so different from an investor thing, you know, that they've ever seen before. And I said, well, I appreciate that. But I, th the, the reality is that a lot of the, the investors in my world, we make decisions around beers and drinks. That's how we do things. It's not a movie, you know, it, it, people perceive that it's kind of like this really structured situation. It's not. And so you've got this informality on the investor side, you've got informality on the research side. Why do we have to have this formal thing in between? When in the end, I think it's actually stopping the flow of real communication. That's, you know, these, these type of things, I think it's important for me to, to you know, give a little bit of insight into. Yeah, you said you've been doing this for about 15 years now. And so I think just, it seems like you've learned a lot about how to build these relationships and cultivate these networks. And so maybe if someone is starting in this realm like 15 years ago, like what advice would you give yourself on like what you wish you would have done at the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, it's very, it's very difficult there. Like to, um, one thing I'll, I'll point out is that I, I understand that the age group of people that listen to this podcast. In fact, some of the guys at Uni Tennessee were saying, "Yeah, they listen to this." It was, it was so cool. And they're like, "Oh, you, you're going on? That's awesome, man!" Like, really? I said, "Yeah, I think so." But I was like, you know, think that it's the, the best relationships, really, and we all know this in our lives. I mean, you get business relationships, and they can turn into very good relationships as well. But you know, when you when you grow up with a peer group of people, and the only thing that you're interested in is your friendship, because you like them, you talk about basketball, you just hang out, just talk crap, and just do all this stuff. You know, like they're real relationships. So I and they withstand time. It doesn't matter what people are doing; that is irrelevant. And I think the best thing that happened for me was that. It kind of touched on the early point was that I took the opportunity every time to meet people. And it turns out that I've got such a good group of friends in Sydney, which is quite strange given I'm in Perth. But and some of my friends are a part of very large family offices that are very well known in Australia, you know. But when I see them, yes, we work together. We got stuff together. We, we put the business thing aside and we all know it's it can sometimes go wrong and sometimes it goes well, but we share the journey, but we are friends, you know? And I think that if there's one thing I can tell people, um, if they want to get started, it, whether it regards to whether it's a researcher or investor or whatever, I think forming those networks as early as you can. And I think in university culture, you do it very well because it, it is already in the culture, go and have drinks and just hang out and you don't have no ulterior motive, you know? You just want to hang out because it's fun. And I think, isn't that awesome, right? So you kind of use that, in in way like in, in your career it could benefit you but i think oftentimes those networks are are the best and and that's what i would i would i would say i love that i so i have a question about networking it's been such a key component of our podcast but it's also been like pivotal for my even like my job search a couple of years ago and and beyond right and i'm an adamant like support or like, you know, I always say, I think networking just continues, will, will play a massive role regardless of where you're at in your, in your career or your journey. But I want to see how do you go about that? Cause for a lot of people, it's not a formalized process and I don't think it necessarily should be, but I just wanted to see how did those relationships form in your life? Are they natural or are they, are there tools that you use or like processes you go through to kind of build those relationships or even like reach out to people for the first time yeah i, th I think that you know, I understand what you're trying to say you know for people who are just starting out is there is there things that they could do certainly things like conferences and that type of thing is is, is a good way to do it i think you'd be surprised if people actually stop and consider who they know that could help them go you know find a different network they'd actually be quite surprised the world is quite a small place i think those type of word of mouth or those 
extension of current friendships is, is the best way, but where there's an opportunity to, to meet a whole different bunch of people. That's a, I think the research community, you know, already has that in place largely. And I think, Carl, you know, I listened to the podcast that you guys had and you guys did on the conferences. I think that's a really, really good way to do it. It's very hard to formulate these things. I think that, you know, again, if you go to a conference, you don't want to talk to anyone. That's also not going to be that helpful, right? So, you know, you got to, you got to get yourself out there and, and, you know, take that risk, you know, and then what's really the risk? What's the downside? You know, you're, you're going to meet a whole heap of people. Like, that's pretty cool you know and, and sharing the commons interest but i think i mean guys one of the other things maybe i could ask you guys some questions you guys know yeah we'll go yeah for sure a little bit How's that? <laughs> we'll change it up when you think of investors right i'm sure you guys have had ideas in the past and you thought of different things like how do you perceive the investment situation and how do you even process that and carl you you can also want to want in that situation now uh, with maxines you know i i what what do you think about investors generally the, the whole process what does that mean to you well i can say first that my preconceptions and my current understanding are different after you know like having experiences like meeting you at grc and you know starting to talk more to people and even looking into it myself which we can follow up with after but like working with a material like maxine that's very interesting you know there's all this talk there's a company in japan currently that licenses maxine Murata manufacturing so you know working on a material that is at that like i would say cutting edge makes you think about it and before hand I kind of saw investors as like far away in the distance kind of thing like that you like someone else had to figure out but it's not true like you have to figure it out actually like how to explain to people who are interested in your research why your research applies to this situation you know like originally when I thought about it it's more like oh like so many things have to happen before there'd be like you know people interested in investing in like a materials technology but now I see like no like it's actually the researchers that have to tell people about the materials technology otherwise these investors are never going to find it They're, and then you have to like make that connection at least that's how i see it yeah for sure and just to add on to that david and i last year attended the puzzle x conference and you know going into it i imagine just you know being able to network with a lot of other material science researchers you know and meeting ceos of, of materials companies but i think something that was kind of unexpected for both david and i was the amount of investors that we that we talk to or people that belong to VC firms and they honestly a lot of our like coolest conversations or most natural conversations came with with these people who were just trying to learn about these technologies they were very curious didn't necessarily have the full technical experience but that's what made them great conversationalists right they're not they didn't really have like an agenda you kind of i guess the way i interpreted it was like you know obviously they're working for a company that wants to invest in unicorns or even you know like groundbreaking technologies just for the chance for it to to blow up but the way we had those conversations it was very natural and it was just like just being able to share more about our experiences and learn learn about what their life was like as well you know in terms of the traveling and the people that they get to chat with both at these conferences as well as you know at at dinners or bars you know afterwards similar to the experiences you're talking about so right now it's just kind of connecting a lot of the dots for me so that's that's kind of my my perspective on investors now now that we've had that puzzle x conference but david i wanted to see if you had anything to add yeah i mean like like you said and like puni says that i, I feel like in the, the relationship between the investor and the founder is extremely important for the growth of any company and so i think we've started to see glimpses of it through the people we've met because it takes a strong technical founder, but also, like you said, Kyle, is that they have to get it out there. And so I think that's where a good relationship between the people who are help funding and getting your word out there with these connections that Jung was talking about, and then the person trying to make it work, not any one person can really do it all. And so I think that what we've seen is the most successful companies have the best relationships where they're able to trust the other person completely to help them reach the ultimate goal that they both believe in. So I think that a lot of companies that fail, the technology could be ahead of their time or could just not work. But a lot of the times it's that there's a breakdown and you can't either get more money or the technology isn't moving at the right pace. And just, I think that's why it's important to be able to understand where you are at the project and the needs. And so that's why I think the connection between the two people in that relationship is the most important. And maybe you could say that is true or false, Young. 
Well, look, I am listening very, very intent, like very, very closely to you guys because you've seen so many. You've, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to work through the podcast list and going, you know, you've met so many researchers. I, I can't help but think, guy, though, guys, like I think that the researchers probably need to be able to articulate what they're, you know, what they're working on, but a bit better. I think that's obviously going to be helpful. But I also think it's a, it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of. I think investors also need to change it up, and I, I think. Kaneeth, like you mentioned, you got, I don't know what the, the Puzzle X thing was about, but um, it, it sounds like it was it was like it, like investors were expected to turn up, which is the reason why you guys turned up. I think that's great. That that's not that's a good first step. But I also think it's 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 the investors need to do a bit more work. And I think, and I think that it, it's it's very it's a big ask, you know, to to get researchers to that that they're, they're so busy. To go to these events, to go pitch the thing. I mean, that it takes a certain type of person to even do that. And I think the people on this, you know, for you guys, you're relatively experienced. You know, you got a bit of, you got a bit of, you know, not not you're not extroverts, but you know, what I'm trying to say, like you, you're quite comfortable taking the next step and reaching out, right? But a lot of people aren't. And I think that where there's a breakdown in the system, which I'm I'm quite aware of it now, the university spin out ecosystem is that there's there's a requirement for the researchers to, to disclose their invention to the university. And that creates a whole different headache for the researcher that they probably don't want to put up with. And I think I've heard that a million times. So probably got 80% of the, I mean, I'll, I'll be quite, I'll, I'll just throw some numbers out there, you know, but it, I think just to give you the idea, I, I reckon you've got 80% of the world's best ideas, not just in material science, but generally speaking, sitting in the labs, in their minds, because they just don't know how to do, to, to spin it out or to form a company or to do something like that without having to go through the headache of dealing with all the stuff that university, you know, all the processes at university. And it's not, it's not a, it's not the state university system is not right. It's actually required. It's very important to get that piece right. But I think the researcher and the teams, they need to understand and, and get that confidence from, from someone in, in the markets or the investors saying, yeah, Iron is a great idea. And then together going to the university says, look, we want to do this. And I, I think the university would love that too, because it then, then it becomes like a, it's kind of like already halfway there, you know, and they can do something with it and, and make really good use of time. So I'm trying to draw this picture of, of what I'm seeing. And I, I think this is right. But I, I mean, you guys are a better place than me, but you guys are in that position now. You're in the right age group. You've got all the stuff going on. You, 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 you know, you're, you're academics are, and, but, and working in the industry, some of you guys, but I, I think that this is the, this is the kind of thing that's happening, you know, and I, I think we need to do something about it. Like we need to take some steps towards helping this, you know, break this down. Yeah, for sure. And just that this was something that came up when you were asking about the perspective of a, like a material scientist towards an investor. And it was something that I wanted to just hear your thoughts on. Because for me, whenever I like, if I've ever had thoughts about starting up a company, you know, and getting funding, raising, raising funding, right? One of the potential concerns with that is like undue pressure or potentially unnecessary or unrealistic expectations from the stakeholder perspective on like the progress that we can make in a given time frame, right? Or just, you know, that type of relationship. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Maybe that's some something that yeah. other researchers are facing as well if they're potentially concerned about starting a company. So I just wanted to give you the floor there to offer a counter perspective. Yeah, I, I think like investors go, where is it? Why is it taking so long? You know, what's happening? Exactly. That kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a pretty common thing. I I think the the way I like to think about these things is I think it helps to have a 12 month time frame and to think about uh we're not talking about January revenue here. We're talking about getting out of the lab. And Carl, we had a discussion a few days ago. It was really great for me too. I, I hope it helped you guys because it really clarified in my mind what this is all about. This optimization phase, I think Carl, didn't we we ended up with that this language that's kind of like yeah. words around this. An optimization phase. What does that mean? Get it out of the lab. It works really well in the lab. That's awesome. But now we've got to scale it up and it's going to be technically challenging because it probably involves some engineering things to think about, right? Which you don't have to think about in the lab. So we need us as investors and the researcher to agree in 12 months time. And we've got you know X amount of money that we're going to raise to achieve this very important milestone. It's not revenue, just to reiterate, but wow, you know, if we achieve this, whatever metrics we're trying to measure um, and that happens, that's really cool. That hasn't been done before. That's, that's the... The discussion. So if you have that, if you have that understanding as well, I, I called up with one of the, the guys who had the spin out in uh, Tennessee yesterday. And he was telling me this really funny thing, Panith. He was talking about some investors wanting like his EBITDA um, 
calculations and his cash flow forecast. And I'm like, what? what what's that? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> why? You're a startup. Like, it's, you know, it's, what, 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 what revenue? Like, I, I said, like, look, man, like, I think, I, I don't know who, I don't, he, obviously, I didn't want to know who the investors are. I probably wouldn't know who they are, but I'm thinking that's probably the wrong investor. I think you, you need to start looking somewhere else because any investor, and that's as a general comment for everyone listening to this thing, I think for the podcast, I think that, that, yeah, the investor should well understand that this is early stage. It's really high risk. It's probably going to have a couple of pivots in between, right? Things that don't quite work out. But we're a team, right? We're, we're forming a team. This is not put money in. I'll see you in twelve months' time. You're five times my money. This is this is like working together, and we share the risk and we share the reward, and we cut up the equity pie accordingly so that it reflects the risk taken by everyone and the time committed to it. I, I think if you have if you can have that discussion in a really honest, transparent way, going back to what we just spoke about having that relationship, looking, look, just tell me what the problems are, guys. Like, you know, what, tell me what, what the issues we might face, because we also, we also are raising capital from other people. You know, we, we need to be responsible in the sense of what the challenges are. And it's okay. It's okay to tell people that it's not all the lovely PowerPoint going to the right, up and right. You know, it's, we know it's not to the right. We, we get it. And the investors, our skill set. We should understand that. And if you come across people who can't, you, you just feel, man, these guys are putting so much pressure on me. Like I just, I feel like, yeah, the money's there, but they're just trying to wrap everything up. And they're, they're, it's just the details. It's like, I'm really uncomfortable about this. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not the right project. It's not the right person. It's not the right dynamic. It should never be like that. It should be exciting. It should be really interesting. It's like, finally, you know, someone said yes. And you wake up every day and you're just pumped to get, to go and make the phone call, hey, Keong, you know, like, man, we did this yesterday. It works. Like, man, you believe that? Bring him, oh, man, it didn't work. Like, we thought it was going to work. We didn't think, oh, dang, you know, we got, I got to go back to the team and it might delay things for another week, you know, but I'll come back to you. I'll text you, like, two, in two days' time. I'll let you know. That's what we want, right? That's a proper relationship, early stage. So maybe as a question for you, for, like, more people who are interested in this investment role, what do you think like your primary role is once you invest the money in the company? Like what's your job at that point for that company? Yeah, the for OTB Ventures and and I'll at the end I'll I'll give a summary. I'll give a, a why we came up with OTB. It's quite a funny story. I think our approach in our business model, David, is specific to us. We're not passive investors. We are active investors. We put in, we raise money, we'll put in our own money. Uh, we raise the capital. But uh, we're telling people we we have to go to work, and 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 it was a very interesting approach. And this has developed over the last few months, actually. So, and I think we're getting very very close. The initial concept of, as you guys are aware, you know, as founders, you have a hundred percent, right? And then you you raise money and you dilute by say twenty percent, and you have eighty percent of the company, and the investors have twenty percent, and everyone's happy and moves ahead, right? It actually is. It's almost doomed for failure. I mean, not all the time, but it, it's actually structurally not reflective of what's actually going on. Because if you think about it, as a researcher, a PhD student, or just a recent graduate, you are basically telling the investor, and they've believed it, or they might have you not thought about it, but they've believed it implicitly, that that researcher, that, that university academic, and their team have the skills to raise further capital, have those networks, know how to spin stuff out, corporate leaks, corporate stuff, set up a board, Shareholder agreements, corp tax, legal, IP, patents, the whole box and dice. Like it, this is an amazing, like that is exactly effectively what people are saying when they do that 80, 20 thing, you know, or what, it, you know, I'm just trying to give you the, the classic, what people think of that raised capital. I mean, it, it's not to say it won't work. I mean, you've got the exception to the rules, but you can understand what I'm trying to say. I, I think guys, like, I think that's that your chances of success is, is pretty low because it is just too much to expect from. So our approach at OTB is to come in as a founder. So yes, we will be shareholders too from the start um, with the research team, but we divide the pie up to reflect what we think is the value of the researcher and what they've got. I mean, everyone's different, so you can't, I don't want to put any, any fixed numbers on that, but you know, there's general ranges of something and we come in and we agree and we have this discussion and we come to agreement on what we think that pie looks like before we go and raise money. So I think if you take that approach, then the researcher, I actually spoke to one yesterday who, who was looking to spin something out. He was like visibly relieved. He was like, oh, that's such a good, that's so good. That's such a great idea. <laughs> I was really stressed out about all that. So I said, man, of course you're stressed out. I would be, it's like, it's like you, someone coming in and, and I've, I've read some books on YouTube or something on, 
on material science some some topic and now I'm, I, and then now you expect me to like find do more like I, that's just not that's not possible you know and how how can you replicate all those years of experience in that if you don't do this and i think if that's in people's mind and they understand it's not trying to take advantage of the situation it's just saying look like we can't we need to make this make sure that we understand what we're dealing with and then we raise the money we've probably got the money you can understand from that approach the chances of success are probably high because the research can just focus on what they meant on the things they're good at we can do our thing and then when it comes time to raise the next round of money we should probably our job would to make sure that we basically already got that ready to go just waiting for the research to get to that point. But that's our job. That's our role in, in the company. So just follow up there. So that totally makes sense to me in terms of, you know, you have your certain skill set and expertise and a researcher would have their certain skill set and expertise. One, I guess, one area where I see a potential gap is like when you expand the team, when you find new researchers and et cetera, maybe that's all within that same lab, for example. But I just wanted to see you know from previous experiences how do you figure out you know when and how to find those like that talent right from like the material science perspective or as you're scaling up process engineers manufacturing engineers r d etc like how are you able to acquire that talent and know that they're the right fit for this new company well it's actually kyle's a great person to ask for this because we're we actually without having to give away the whole box and dice kyle you know but just generally speaking in terms of what panice is asking we're investing things so we don't we this is not our area of expertise because it's so niche you know like these things are generally really specialized in niche how are we going to find people ring up like a website or something or ring up a headhunter <laughs> it's like that's not going to happen it is certainly within the community right within that little community of the lab you're right this type of things but we would be looking to the to the researcher to be able to put forward a team of people remember this optimization we're not talking about like commercial scale we're just trying to get out of the lab right but we would be going to people like carl saying look you know if you what give us your budget and your plan and in your budget and plan you would have to have certain roles of people that you that are going to be involved in the spinner yeah essentially from the from the material science like researcher side essentially you need to figure out what you already have and then figure out what you definitely need and don't have and that's when you are going to have to start like a like like how he said like in, in your network hopefully you've built up a network you can start leveraging contacts maybe you don't have the right person but you might know somebody who does or know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who does and that's enough because definitely no matter where you go you're not going to find every single answer that you need and you're going to have to expand outside of like whatever bubble you're currently in but yeah i mean i think that's you know like my previous talk on the podcast was about going to conferences and networking so it's like hopefully once you enter the professional space you have like a large network that you can like leverage and build from for those kind of uses and I will say building on these, you know, like we're talking about like, you know, kind of the perspective on like one side, but uh, it's great to have the business mindset people like taking care of some of the business mindset, you know, places that we lack in. But I know that there are definitely listeners, you know, students, researchers who probably want to know a bit more about like the business side, but don't even know how to approach that. Do you also have any suggestions like on that? Like, you know, it's like they're not trying to get a, ba you know, like a MBA. They're just trying to know what words mean, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. It's oh, Carl. I, I think you know. I'm not fully aware of the, all the educational resources around for that. I'm sure there's. You can you know go online to a, and do a, a, probably have perhaps a course. I know. I think Berkeley does a course or something like that. I saw a quick uh, thing you know where you can learn some of the basic terms. You know. Yeah. I think that it's actually there's lots of cases online if you want to look at example cases. You know of how certain things develop. And I'm I'm an avid podcast listener, right, for myself. And I, obviously, if we all are here, there's some great podcasts on this topic. The, there's there's the ones that I listen to a lot. And and Tim Ferriss, you know, you, you guys would know, I, I listen to Tim Ferriss a lot. And he, you know, he goes all over the place. And I actually really appreciate the spiritual aspect of it. I mean, it sounds a bit contrite in this, in this discussion because we're talking about material science. But I think philosophically, I, I agree with that. And I think that's, you know, at, on that level, we're able to engage. And I, he, he obviously talks a lot about technology and companies and, and things like that and how they started up and, the, and all that. I think just being around it and just, you know, just by just absorbing the information and, and, and just being around it. And how did Tesla form? You know, what's the story? Bees, Amazon, you know, you've got these amazing, there's, and there's so much material out there. And they're really interesting because they don't talk about numbers and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we, we need to understand dilution and, you know, cap raises and options and all this. That's fine. 
that's that understand that but it's more about the story right of how these things kind of evolve and then from there you can start work out in your mind okay that was the first round second round okay that's what people are thinking in the third round i think that that's what that's what's really helpful if they want to tell to your point if people are having interest in business yeah to do that but again there's one point i actually do want to make the the topic of this you know of our discussion today i'd love to see what titles you guys come up with but i think that this idea that investing and and or investors and research and pro or projects you know these mutually exclusive concepts and sometimes they meet right sometimes you get that chemistry and, and you do something but if you think about it if we want to actually do stuff in the real world and and the time the listeners people listening to this podcast in their own vertical in their own area of expertise they can actually if they get it out and they get and they can find that way to do that it actually changes the world in iterations you know what i mean you don't have that opportunity in life very often to do that stuff and researchers do you know like you really do so i actually think that relationship between the re the research and the investors is actually very very close and i think that they actually need to coexist we shouldn't be thinking about investing in research as two separate topics is actually the same. And I think investors need to do the work to understand the research and vice versa. But without this, like it won't, it won't see the light of day. And isn't that a shame? Because we know on the percentages, like I just mentioned, how many don't get disclosed for reasons. Of the ones that, that, that somehow people like me find, how many are not being talked about? And we all know how brilliant these people are. We got to get it out. You know, that, that's, and for us here on this, on, this, on this podcast, that's actually somewhat a responsibility. And I take responsibility too for that because we're trying to get the word out there, aren't we? We're trying to help people and educate people. And I think that if we do things like this, it's, it's just like, it'll be so fulfilling, you know, in, 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 in morally and phys in, in terms of how we, we think about these things. But I, I just think, I just want to make that point. And, and I think that being relevant, making investors relevant, going for drinks, going out to midnight, sitting around in, in, you know, in sneakers and runners and t-shirts and just hanging out with people. That's where it happens. That, and I, I can't stress that enough. And you guys experienced that yourself. I'm um, at that Puzzle X thing. Yeah, for sure. And so first of all, I just wanted to like for our listeners who, who have this potentially, maybe they're at the, the stage where they just have an idea or maybe they're a little bit beyond that. You know, how can they get in contact with you, for, for example, but also just in general, right? Like, how can they really like connect the dots and get in touch with investors who, who might be aligned in terms of, you know, where they want to invest their time and money into, you know, I know you mentioned conferences. So again, just to summarize, feel free to share your, your contact info and, and we can drop that in, in the description as well, but just sure. general advice for someone who's potentially in that position, but doesn't quite have that, that network just yet. Yeah, I think that it's probably, it's, it's difficult, you know, even at conferences, it, because you're already in that, in the, you've already had this expectation and the, and the vibes may be a little bit different, you know, like I can imagine if you turn up at these things, like people are, you know, it's, it's kind of like a bit, a bit hectic in the sense that, oh, what, what's your thing? You know, like, oh, I've got this, oh, okay, great. I'm going to talk to that person now, you know, it's, it's probably a little, you don't really get that that they don't really dive very deep, right? In those sort of yeah. scenarios. Certainly, you know, anyone on the podcast is things like you've got your, you'll have my contact details. I'm always, I'm always looking for stuff. But I think that if you can do some basic searching around investors and, and LinkedIn's a wonderful thing because people tend to link to similar minded people. I've heard, I haven't personally had too much experience in Silicon Valley at all, but I've heard it's, it can be quite a, a tough process, you know, and because of, because I suppose there's a bit of a, they're, they're through technology investing, they've, to develop the kind of process for that, which may not suit material science. You know, I, I think it's actually quite different technology and material science because it's deep tech, right? So I think that the LinkedIn thing is a great way to go. There's certainly very good investors all over the place. And actually it, it's not the ones with the profile, even at, at a local level within the communities, they will, they, there are people around who do these type of things and trying to find these things, find these type of people. I think it's not too difficult to be able to reach out to some of the university resources that if you, those people at the top there, in my experience, they're pretty well networked. They, they, they know people, they, they really know people. Like if you can get somehow into that, into the, into the VCs and sorry, you know, the, the vice chancellors and, and this type of thing, if you can find a, a reason to be around them, look, I've got, and if you said to them, can you imagine if you went up to look, I've got this spin out. It's a really interesting. I do know anyone who might be interested. I think they'd be pretty happy to help. And, You'd be surprised. Yeah, I can call that person. Yeah, yeah, I can. I'll reach out. I know someone. I, I'm almost certain that that will happen. 
So it doesn't have to be the profile people you Google online. You can, they are actually in the community. And I think within university, I think what you described is probably, probably a good start. Awesome. Okay. So I guess I just wanted to kind of recap with, and I know everybody basically touched on this, but I just wanted to say like David and I, as we've learned a lot about business just through the It's Material World podcast. So I know yeah. it's not quite, you know, the like spin out from a, from university research, but it's just a message that I wanted to send as well is that there's a lot of growth that happens when you start something and then you continue to grow it from the ground up. Like I've just learned so much about just business strategy, financials, building a team, continuing to learn about that as well. Like there's culture aspects, growing as a leader. There's a lot of things that you don't initially think of when you start something, but I've enjoyed every single moment of it. And I've learned so much and I feel like the podcast has been the biggest like personal development opportunity that I've had. And I've had various internships, been part of various clubs. So that's just another reasoning, I think, of potentially if you if you have this thing that you feel has a lot of potential and you are very passionate about it, like go for it, you know, and continue to network and you might find that that right team that can help turn that into this dream into a reality. Thank you so much for saying that. Because this is about personal growth, isn't it? You know, like, yeah, you know, having spin ups kind of stressful sometimes, but it's actually a whole heap of fun. You know, it's it's the things that you have to think about and to do. That's not not you won't be receiving that if you you know if you work for a large corporate or or if you're an academic within a university. You know, it's just a very very different thing. And and this concept of work life balance, you know, I haven't had work life balance in a long time because I don't consider them separate. I I consider what I do has been part of my life. And I'm very, very fortunate. I know that and I get to get to choose what to do with my time to a large extent. I think if you're in that position, if you can do that, then then it's a wonderful thing. And it's actually a, de- a decision to be made. You know, it's not it's not unachievable. It's actually something that can happen. So I, for myself, I, Panith and David, like I would regularly just get on my scooter back at home in Perth, Western Australia. And I'll scoot, my family knows, all my friends know this, and, and some people I work with know this. I will just listen to a podcast and I'm not talking to anyone for like an hour, you know, because I just need time to think about this stuff. I'm going up to Maine to an RGRC. I told you, Carl, right? I'm going up to yeah, Maine. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about GRC. It's actually a retreat for the mind because you're not distracted. You're focused on what's happening, you know, with all these really cool, interesting people. It's actually food for the mind, you know, because it's, 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 and they do it in these locations where it's quite isolated. There's not much else going on. So it's such a privilege to be in that environment, but we can all do that in our lives. And I think that, yeah, beneath back to your point, that is so, such a good point around personal development and growth. It's about, you know, spiritually and philosophically, you know, as we, as we mature, how you think about things. And guess what? You're going to make lots of mistakes. I made so many mistakes as a, as a director, an executive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I made so many mistakes. And I'm trying to learn from them. I've got a long way to go. But that being in the startup allows you to make lots of mistakes very quickly, you know, and then you kind of improve very, very quickly, much, much quicker than you would in a, in a normal or well, normal setting. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And thank you for, for that insight and just for sharing your experiences. It's been truly a very like unique episode, but I've really enjoyed it a lot just being able to have this very natural conversation with you. And I would love for you to kind of wrap up with just sharing, you know, how can our listeners reach out to you if they're interested in chatting more? Yeah, well, I have my LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is the best way to get me. I, I will have, I'll provide my contact details and you can put them in the show notes beneath. And David, thank you so much. I've just got one last, I was going to leave the story of OTB, right? And yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, OTB, what's it mean? I think it's on a website, I can't remember. It's called Out the Back. So it's Out the Back Ventures. We didn't want another capital. We didn't want anything. So we're kind of like, we've always got this thing, myself and John Rock, my other co-director, we, we're, all, we're quite rebellious in this way, aren't we? So we think about, the reason why out the back so in australia generally everyone's around the water right we grew up we grew up surfing we, we that's what we do and out the back means that so when the wave's coming you'll see it coming and then you're about you'll go and take off you'll be okay i'm going to take this wave and you go and on the shoulder of the wave if it's a big one if you've got a friend your friend will be pointing like this or if, the, if you don't have a friend out there you'll see people furiously paddling and then you and the reason why they're doing that is because there's another wave out the back. And generally speaking, waves come in sets of threes. And if there's a good, if you 
if you leave the first one, the second one, the third one get better and better. And that I think it's a really good analogy because it's a few things. Obviously, the obvious one is that, yeah, you always try to see what's next, right? But strategically in, in business, and I think in life as well, to, to a lot of extent, and business and life are very interrelated, right? and, and they teach a lot of lessons, right? I mind you. But by not falling, just thinking, oh, I do this really obvious step. That's really obvious. You know, of course I'm going to do that. And you and I, in my my own life and in best and in business, have made that mistake of of just going for the obvious. And it's been a huge mistake because I don't even know I've done it. You know, I made I made this decision. I didn't realize it was so compounding down the track. And I think that's a real really good lesson and a really good thing to keep in mind. That's why we named it as OTB. Because, and I think people would understand what I'm trying to say, is that that thing around out the back, the next one, is actually what's happening. And you need to, what you need to do is while you're working on something, you need to read and you need to listen to people and get get as much information as possible because they're the ones paddling over there, you know? And you need to know, you need to know that's happening. And that's that's the reason for OTB. So that's a bit, and I think that's it really, and when I tell the story, I told, I was in Detroit talking to the guys at GM Ventures. They're like, wow, that's a, that's a great, that's, yeah. I could see like, yeah, that, that resonated. People remember that. So that was just the final thing I want to leave you with. I love that analogy. And I'm excited to see what Out the Back Ventures continues to accomplish and seeing you potentially immerse yourselves into the material science world. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kion. Pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure everyone. Thanks for that. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who've been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.